Well, thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's great to be in this place uh, at the end of the day. And since we are at the end of the day, I want to start with the good news. <clears throat> uh, the good news is that <clears throat> basically uh, life expectancy continues to grow. <clears throat> and <clears throat> in the Lancet of February, they said basically in Korea it's going to reach 90 years of uh, life expectancy by 2030. Uh, Italy, France are falling just behind that. So <clears throat> the problem of today is, a, a, I don't know it's a problem. I don't, I don't find that as a problem, especially by the more I age, the less of I find the problem. <clears throat> but the, the thing is that we should remind ourselves that we, our species, as uh, more or less three million years of history. And life expectancy for those three million years has not been 87 years or 90 years. Actually, uh, the latest studies, uh, especially now with that we are able to sequence the genome, or the human genome, of, of, <coughs> or the genome of our predecessors in small pieces of bone found in caves in South Africa, Asia, Northern Europe, we are rewriting the human history, and <clears throat> what is, turns out that, I mean, is we are older than three million years. Uh, and there are some new things, for instance, three years ago was found that we all know the Neanderthal man, and we thought it was a dead branch of the human evolution. Well, we have to accept that 3% of the Neanderthal man genome is in our genome. And that has been found recently. So we are really rewriting the human history thanks to the genomics and the things. And, and then we know at some point, 100,000 years ago, man went out of Africa and we got like that. But <clears throat> what we need to keep in mind is for 3 million years, life expectancy has been between 30, 25 and 35 years. And only recently, 1750, life expectancy started to grow and grew very, very rapidly. And today we are 85, and we are going for 90. And if you believe the Time Magazine, we are going for 142. But that will take a few years. We need to wait a few years to see that, whether that is true. <clears throat> so bottom line, our species gained 55 years since 1700, and 35 years since 1900. 1900 is a century ago. It's not that long. I mean, if you take a century in three million years, you can figure out how lucky we are. <clears throat> now, obviously, if you have this situation, uh, you ask a question, why life expectancy went up so much recently? To do that, you need data. And as usual, <clears throat> the best place to find good, solid data is the United States. And you go there, you look at the record, you ask the question, uh, what was life expectancy in 1900? 47 years. What's the life expectancy today? It's not as good as Europe, but it's 80 years. And this is the growth. And the next question is, why, why people were dying in 1900? And why are they dying today? And you do that exercise for all these things, and you find <clears throat> Uh, one very simple thing. You see, next slide, I divide all the causes of mortality into infectious diseases and all the other causes. Infectious diseases are yellow, and all the other causes are red. And basically, you see, 1900, United States, 57% of the people died from infectious diseases. And then infectious diseases went down, went down, went down. Today, they are less than 5%. But still important. They're still going in the newspapers. The most interesting thing is that which were the infectious diseases that were killing people in 1900? And you find diphtheria. Well, it was seen a case of diphtheria today. Uh, but in 1900, in Germany, there were 50,000 50, deaths of, from diphtheria, one country. 1920, United States, 15,000 deaths from diphtheria. Uh, and then you obviously could go smallpox. 
uh, measles, mumps, rubella, tetanus, pertussis, all the things that we discussed before. And so basically, life expectancy has increased by a lot, mostly by conquering infectious diseases. And as you know, infectious diseases have been conquered by three things, uh, hygiene, clean water, vaccines, antibiotics. So that's the introduction to vaccines. And <coughs> vaccines have done a fantastic job. Uh, by taking care of all the, the diseases of children, basically they eliminated all the infant mortality, or most of the infant mortality, and increased our life expectancy uh, <coughs> up to the one we have today. All these diseases, the one, diphtheria, all, all these things, used to kill millions and millions, are gone. Uh, <coughs> the only one which is missing is RSV, and I'll tell you in later in my talk that we are going to make it, so that will be done. So uh, vaccines have done a great job, almost finished this uh, group of our population, infants and children. What's next for vaccines? Have we finished, or do we have more job to do? Well, but recently we started to have a new target, pregnant women for influenza, pertussis, things. <coughs> uh, uh, and uh, so this is the next target. But it's amazing. In the era of aging population, really, we have not paid any attention, vaccinologists like me, they really did not pay much attention to make vaccines for the elderly. The best we have done is to <coughs> take a flu vaccine, but we know it's not re really that great, this vaccine. I mean, it's, a <coughs> it's not, I mean, it's, it's okay, but could be, could be much better. We have a pneumococcus vaccine, and there is a question that says, well, maybe it works when you are 60, but what if, when you are <coughs> 70, 75, you don't have anything for that. Uh, we have a licensed zoster vaccine that works reasonably well in the 50s, 60s, but then the, uh, the live attenuated vaccine, basically the efficacy goes down with age. Uh, and that's it. So why is that? Well, I've been developing vaccines the last 35 years. <clears throat> basically, I never had the problem. I never try to develop a vaccine for the elderly. What we used to do is work for vaccines for children and infants, and then <clears throat> if there is a need for a vaccine, maybe in the elderly, we recycle the same vaccine. But it's never been in our mindset that this is a, a target population for which we need a specific, specific <clears throat> uh, plan to develop vaccines. Um, with Giuseppe, a few years ago, we, we thought that we should start thinking that way, and we organized a meeting in 2009, Aging and Immunity, <clears throat> and we tried to put together immunologists and vaccinologists, say, well, maybe we should talk, start to talk about the elderly. Well, we realized that no immunologist ever thought about, more or less, uh, the immune system of the elderly. Now, the, after a few meetings, we have a dialogue. The first time, we didn't have a dialogue. So, what could we do if we had really a plan to vaccinate for the elderly? Well, we could do better vaccines for flu, pneumo, uh, zoster, all these kind of things. We could develop vaccines for antibiotic-resistant bacteria that are a real problem, especially in this age group. We could probably uh, prevent cancer instead of trying to cure it once it's too late. With the new technologies, we could probably vaccinate <coughs> women when they are 50 and, uh, for breast cancer or men for prostate cancer when they are 50 and delay cancer by 15, 20 years, maybe forever if we are good enough. So <coughs> that is something that we could do, but we really we are not focused on doing that. The vaccine developers have not yet focused on Let's do vaccines for the elderly. I mean, let's study the immunology of the elderly. Let's do that. We have not done that yet, or we are starting to do it now. Uh, there are other targets you could do for vaccines, poverty, emerging infections, but I will not spend much time on that. 
Now, that's the sh scenario. And now I'll tell you about the technologies that we can use that are in our hands. And if we focus on developing vaccines for the elderly, what, the way we could change the scenario. So vaccines started with Pasteur and Jenner, and basically for more than a century, making a vaccine, a vaccine meant you grow a virus, a bacterium, or a parasite, you inactivate, which means you kill it and inject it, or you attenuate live and inject it, or you purify a component and inject it. That was all vaccinology for more than a century. <clears throat> In 1980, few things started, new technologies started to come, and usually each wave of technology brought new vaccines. I'll give you some examples. And you may ask, well, this was 2010, what's the stage of the te technologies today? That's the way I see it. To today, we have an explosion of new technologies. Vaccinology is really changing. Uh, the, we had this technology that already changed the way we do vaccines. The new ones are really transformative. The no, new knowledge in immunology, synthetic biology, <coughs> new adjuvants, RNA. I mean, these things, I mean, in 15 years, vaccines would be very different from the one we know today. So what can we do with that? Uh, well, I'll go through some of these technologies. Conjugate vaccines were not there in 1980. Today we have vaccines, licensed vaccines for hemophilia influenza, pneumococcus, meningococcus. We are developing vaccines for group E. streptococcus. Pneumococcus conjugate vaccines licensed in the elderly. So this new technology brought new vaccines uh, that are available today. Uh, the next thing uh, that came was genomics. And, and there came uh, in our laboratory because we were trying to solve the problem of meningococcus B. And we had tried the middle 90s, all the technologies that we had at that time, and we didn't, basically, we couldn't solve the problem like anybody else. People have been trying for 30, 40 years, no solution. And then Craig Venter published the sequence of a bacteria, the genome of a bacteria. We said, well, that's a new technology. That's a kind of revolutionary technology. Maybe we can use that to make a vaccine for meningococcus B. And that's what we did. Instead of starting by growing bacteria, we started from the information in the genome. And from the information in the genome, we found out there were 2,148 genes uh, that coded for proteins. We predicted the proteins would be on the surface. And we tried to express them in E. coli, and then we made sera. And basically, we ended up finding uh, three proteins that had never been described before, but could only be found by looking in the genome. Normal technology could not find them. And these three proteins allow us to make a, a vaccine. We call it reverse vaccinology because we're going, for the first time, from the information to the vaccine, instead of going from the growing the microorganisms to the vaccine. Uh, that was, that was uh, late 90s. Uh, that vaccine now is licensed in the U.S., has been used in, in the U.S. in Princeton for an outbreak. Uh, from September 15, is used for all the newborns in the U.K. The first report is basically 94 percent efficacy, uh, still going on, very good. Uh, so this new technology allowed us to make a new vaccine, which was impossible before. Uh, but making genomics today is easy. And, and so we can not only make vac vaccines for men B, but we can do tackle Staphylococcus, E. coli, C. difficile, Pseudomonas. We can tackle these things. I mean, the technology is there. Some of these vaccines are in development, others will come. Today, the way I look at that is uh, we've gone from the classical vaccinology where you were growing bacteria and parasites and making vaccines to what we call reverse vaccinology 2.0. I mean, when we did meningococcus B back in mid-90s, uh, making one genome, although it was revolutionary at the time, took 14 months. Today we can make hundreds, thousands of genomes one day. So today when we started uh, to do vaccines, we, we, took, uh, we take hundreds of, or thousands of genomes for worldwide. We do the entire epi genomic epidemiology. We look at the proteome. We look at the antibodies from people that are convalescent, 
and we look what kind of epitopes they, they recognize wants to protect. And then we put all this information into our computer, and then we start to design a vaccine. So that's the new, pay, uh, new way of making vaccines. And I'll give you a few, exam few examples. One has to deal exactly with that. Is, uh, we're going to talk about <coughs> uh, what we call structural vaccinology. And this is the best example that we have is respiratory syncytial virus. Uh, 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 Vaccine for RSV has been tested the first time in humans, 1967. It was a complete failure and enhanced the disease. Since then, many people tried, everybody failed, including a few months ago, Novavax failed the phase three on, uh, on RSV. <clears throat> Why? Well, nobody knew that until we and others started to look at the structure of the protective protein, which is the F protein, which is on the surface of the virus, fusion protein. And this protein is present in two stages. One was the pre-fusion, and the other one is the post-fusion. Uh, same amino acid sequence, this is a trimer. Same amino acid sequence, completely different structure. Great vaccine, bad vaccine. Why we've never been able to make a vaccine? Because uh, this form is extremely unstable. There's no way to isolate that. And so as soon as you purify, it moves in this direction. Not only moves in this direction, but since start to aggregate, make aggregates, precipitates, it's a, it's, a, it's a mess. You cannot work with it. Uh, so you have, now that we have the structure of this molecule and this molecule, we can ask the question, how do we solve the problem? And <clears throat> this is a trimer. To facilitate the solution of the problem, I'll, I'll show you a monomer. This is the monomer, and this is the monomer. This is the monomer pre-fusion, this is the post-fusion. Look at these two I mean, red amino acids. They are very far away in this post-fusion, in the bad conformation. But they happen to be very close in this conformation. Now, if you want to solve the problem and lock this conformation, what do you do? You change those two amino acids into cysteines, and now make the sulfide bridge, and the protein is locked. Easy. Even a child could do it. Yeah? But that was absolutely impossible before we knew the structure, the atomic structure of these two molecules. And that happened only three years ago. <clears throat> now, this confirmation is in clinical trials. And I promise you, it's going to make a vaccine for RSV, for infants, for adults, and for the elderly. <clears throat> and that's a way of knowledge and technology, what we have today really can solve the problem. Uh, Give you another example of things that we didn't have before. And these things you have seen in the news, synthetic biology. Today, with our, we're using many viruses as vectors for synthetic genes. I'm sure you've been uh, hearing about chimp adeno, where it's been used for Ebola, the VSV has been used for Ebola. And, but you can use alpha virus, adenovirus, pox, pox virus, CMV, <coughs> measles. And what you do here, you take these vectors and you put into their genome a synthetic gene that will code for Ebola or for uh, MERS or for whatever. And <clears throat> then you use these vectors to make a vaccine. The vector will, in <clears throat> will inject the gene into the cell and the cell will make the vaccine. Uh, today, we, this is the state of the art of today. We are already looking into the next generation where we'll not be using vectors, but we'll use only synthetic molecules, synthetic RNA, and which will be delivered by nanoparticles. So this will be a vaccine which has nothing to do with any biological product. All vaccines are biologicals. This will be completely synthetic. In theory, and we've been working on that, you could basically make a robot 
that can be any place in the world. You introduce the sequence in the, uh, here through internet, you send the sequence to the robot, the robot will make the vaccine for you. You think it's science fiction? It's not, it's coming. So <clears throat> these are <clears throat> things that are coming for the future. Another extremely important tool that is coming today is the ability, is not to make a vaccine, but to understand the immune system and to do vaccines, uh, to improve vaccines, is systems biology. The way I see systems biology is basically uh, <clears throat> is changing the way we do trials and we look at things. So far, anytime we do a trial, we take a lot of people and we ask very few questions to each of them. So that's why we need, we need many big numbers because we need to reach statistically significance there. Now, through systems biology, instead of taking 10,000, for instance, 10,000 people to ask them 10 questions each, you can take 10 people and ask 10,000 questions to each of their, to their B cells, 10,000 10, questions to their T cells, 10,000 questions about safety, 10,000 questions about efficacy. And you'll probably get more information from these 10 people than from these 10,000 people. This is the infancy uh, in vaccines, uh, but <clears throat> what can we get from that? I'll give you only one example. Uh, there is a laboratory, Rafik, has done uh, a vaccination with hepatitis B in young adults and elderly. And has found that young adults, most of them respond, and <clears throat> but some of, even the young adults, don't respond. And the elderly, uh, they find some of them respond and some of them don't respond. And the question is, what's different? And so they do uh, apply systems biology, transcriptomics, and what they find is actually, the people that respond on this thing, whether they are young, red, or elderly, have more or less the same transcriptome. The people that don't respond on this side, whether they are young or elderly, they have the same profile. So what they propose is that they say there's not a young immune system or an old immune system by age. Actually, the immune system has its own bio-age. And if you are on the right of these things, whether you're young or old, you, are, you have an old bio-immune system that doesn't work. If you are on the left, you are a young Im uh, immune system, that's gonna work, regardless whether you are young or old. So that's this concept of bio-age. And then you can ask the question, what's the difference? I mean, and then you go into the transcriptomics, and basically what you see is that the, the ones that have uh, the young bio-age they, and they respond well to vaccination. They have uh, transcription models that are involved in B cell signaling, T cell receptor signaling, antiviral response. The ones that are in the right of the thing, the ones that don't respond, regardless whether they're young or old, <coughs> they have transcriptional models that involve the inflammatory response, cell motility, type 2 interferon. So, clearly increase inflammatory response or chronic inf inflamm inflammation is, is what causes less response. I mean, it's just an example that we can use these things to start to understand the, <clears throat> I mean, how the immune system works even in the elderly. <clears throat> Last thing I want to mention is, which is revolutionized the field, are adjuvants. <clears throat> adjuvants, uh, the the history of adjuvants is interesting. The first adjuvant was alum, phosphate, or, 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 or hydroxide, was introduced with diphtheria toxoid back in 1924. The next adjuvant to be licensed was ME59, that we, Giuseppe, we licensed back in 1997 in Italy uh, for influenza in the elderly. Then uh, <coughs> GSK arrived with the MPL and alum, SO3 and SO4, and now SO1 is coming. And basically, uh, now there's a huge acceleration of <coughs> new adjuvants. And I'll tell you, I'll give you a few examples. I mean, one is the one we did with the influenza. This is not in the elderly, but this is in, in 
<laughs> in children, the classical influenza vaccine uh, in children is approximately 40, 50 percent effective. If you take the same vaccine with the adjuvant, it becomes 86, 90 percent effective. That's pretty good. Uh, in the elderly, it's been more difficult to show the difference. You see it more immunogenicity, but the, in terms of efficacy, we have been able to, in a big study that we did in Italy, to show that basically in the peak of the influenza, <coughs> there is a, a, an adjuvanted vaccine is, is able to reduce hospitalization by 23%, which is also pretty, pretty good. Uh, in GSK, we have a huge panel of adjuvants, <coughs> we, which combine all the possible uh, all the known uh, ability to improve the uh, immunogenicity. So we've been using aluminum salt, uh, oil in water emulsion, liposomes uh, as vectors, and then we use uh, what we call immune enhancers like MPL that targets TLR4, QS21, tocopherol, CPG, and I'll not spend time with all of them. I'll focus on ASO1. <coughs> SO1 is uh, an adjuvant that is composed by uh, QS21, MPL, and is all in a liposome. Uh, a different way of looking at that, you take a component, LPS, uh, from salmonella, you remove the rest of the chain, and you take only the MPL, <coughs> then you take the QS21 from the plants, and then you purify the component, and then you put these two components into a liposome, and that's ASO1. <coughs> the beauty of ASO1 is that this is interferon gamma production. If you take one component of the ASO1, MPL, this interferon gamma, the green line, is pretty bad. If you take the other component, QS21, the blue line, it's pretty bad. But when you put them together, look at this. Huge. So there is a synergy. And we know that MPL targets uh, TLR4, so we know it targets one of the key <coughs> is <coughs> component of the innate immune system. We are not sure exactly what QS21 does, although, I mean, many people have a theory. I prefer to say that we don't know yet for sure. What we know is that when you put them together, they do something very special. What's the special thing they do? Well, just very recently, they allow us to uh, make the first malaria vaccine. And they allowed us to get a zoster vaccine, which is has 90% efficacy in the elderly. Zoster has been mentioned a little bit before, so I'll go a few slides more into that. I think Johnny has already shown zoster increases with age. Uh, he also said that uh, when the cellular immune response goes down, you get zoster. And <coughs> the, uh, we did basically two very large efficacy trials with a zoster vaccine composed by a glycoprotein from the varicella virus from zoster. And ASO1 adjuvant. And this is what we got. Uh, efficacy in the 97% in the 50 years old, in the 60 years old, in the 70 years old, the 70 years old, and in the 90 years old was <coughs> more, more or less 90%. So for the first time with this adjuvant, we have something that induces very strong, long-lasting, eff effective immune response in 90 years old people. This is a incredibly good news for Zoster because I think we never had a vaccine like this. But for me, is even more interesting than what comes next because for the first time we've been able to crack the way to in basically interact with the immune system of 90 years old people. So I can see many other vaccines coming. 
in this thing. And I think this will induce us to start to think that we need to develop vaccines specifically for the elderly and stop recycling the vaccines that we'll be developing for the infants. And with that, I want to uh, finish my talk. Thank you. Spectacular results with Zoster. Uh, do you have any idea what happened to the innate immune system? Because uh, there is a lot of literature uh, that uh, suggests that uh, macrophages and NK cells play a major role uh, in uh, this type of uh, vaccination, and especially when you use uh, adjuvants, uh, which uh, macrophages can be a major target. Do you have any data regarding this? Um, as you can imagine, having an adjuvant of, of this type, which really surprises uh, uh, everybody that sees that, we've been trying to understand what's the mechanism behind. Why the two individual MPL and QST into one alone don't do it, and why when they are together, <laughs> they do the kind of effect. Uh, I don't think we've been able to go down and understand exactly what happens. What, where you're right is that anytime we look, NKs are in the middle. And so there are some people who say the, the NKs are the ones that are responsible for that effect. Uh, I'm still cautious. I'm waiting for more data. But clearly, NKs are there and are important in the process. Thank you for the nice talk. I was very much intrigued by, about the bio age and the response. Um, we know, for example, in older people that a frailty index can also predict immune response. So my question is, how can we as clinicians say that a vaccine will not work or will work in an older person? So will you correlate these findings with uh, clinical assessments, with geriatric assessments, to see how they correlate and can be used in clinical practice? Yeah, I, I think very, very likely if you, <coughs> if you do, uh, I mean, use systems biology in your people, you will find that the, the ones that responded and they are healthy, they will have probably a, a good bio age and the others will have. But I mean, it's an interesting, these are tools that can be applied today. They are not so, so, I mean, different anymore. But clearly, I mean, any elevated chronic inflammation, any, anything is, is a bad signal. I mean, that's, that's, that's clear. Thank you for this great presentation. And my uh, question goes into the same direction. So this individual variation of our immune systems, do you foresee for the future that maybe at some point we will have a method of assessing a person's immune system and then have sort of a tailor-made vaccine so that different people get different vaccines against pneumococcus? And if you do see that, is it going to happen before I retire, which will be in about 10 years? <laughs> uh, <coughs> well, I, I think in 10 years we're not going to have vac different vaccines for di different people. Um, I th from the obviously, we're not done the bioage on the exhaustive trial. But <coughs> from the efficacy that is so high, looks like this, this adjuvant is able to talk also to in, in, <coughs> induce a response also in the ones that have a bad bioage. So probably if we find the right adjuvant, the right stimulus, probably we'll, we'll be able not only to vaccinate the ones that will respond anyway, but also the ones that will not naturally respond. So that, uh, that is more possible within 10 years than the other one. This is, a, I mean, a, a, a very nice discussion, which is very intriguing in a way, whether or not we should think at personalized vaccines or, or we should think to age targeted vaccines. Why? Because uh, when we speak of influenza, for example, we speak of zoster, we speak of uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, we are speaking, A, of uh, infections of the elderly. Okay? But uh, we are speaking also at infections that are either chronic 
or infections that repeatedly, every year, infect individuals. So the uh, aged people have uh, an immunological experience that uh, the, the young people for which most of the vaccines have been done don't have. So this means that probably we should uh, think out of the box in the development of these vaccines and think more at a sort of uh, therapeutic vaccines because the bugs are there. The, 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 the varicella zoster virus is there chronically for life. The influenza, we get uh, the, 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 the influenza every year, or the, the staphylococcus is there, uh, the pseudomonas is there. So this is the way probably we should think of. Uh, I mean, sorry for uh, this. Uh, thing. Hi, this is, uh, I'm Ed Bresnitz. I'm from um, MSD, and that was a very nice presentation. And, um, you know, the results from the ZOE 1570 trials are, are truly remarkable, as, as you point out, and as the data shows. Um, this is a two-dose vaccine. I'm not sure that you mentioned that. And I, I, I'm wondering about your opinion on why you need the two doses, why you don't see the sustained immunologic response with the first dose, as you showed in the phase two trials. Um, and then a comment on whether the, the adjuvant that you're using, the ASO1 system, is the, is the reason for the um, high rate of adverse events that you see with both doses, particularly the grade three reactions that you see which would be, you know, in an older population, they tend to perhaps have less local reactogenicity and they seem to have a pretty high rate. Yeah, the, I mean, obviously, uh, some, of these, some of these adjuvants uh, do have some uh, reactogenicity. The, <clears throat> um, I mean, when we developed MF-59, uh, that was one uh, of the questions we had in our mind. I mean, what happens if you have reactogenicity, uh, the injection side, uh, side, if, if uh, people will like it or not like? And then we will find out that people are actually not really worried if they get pain at the injection site, if they are convinced that they, <coughs> they are getting something that is worthwhile. So uh, I think for the reactogenicity, I'm not that worried and based on the past experience. I mean, this one has not gone into the large population yet, but I, I think based on my experience, I'm pretty relaxed. <clears throat> About the one or two doses, I mean, the vaccine is pretty immunogenic and effective after one dose. Uh, the, uh, I, th I think the trial, when the trial was designed back in 2009, they didn't know that it was going to be so good. If they known that it had been so good, they were, collected the, they were going to do one arm with one dose only. <coughs> the, the thing is that after two doses, obviously, it's much better. Uh, and, the, and, and so, so basically, is uh, do you want two doses or one dose? One, one dose will give you benefit. Two doses will give you more benefit. I, I had thought we'd run out of steam. That was why I was going to ask my question over dinner. But um, so thank you very much for a really interesting talk. And I was so pleased to hear it because I think many of us earlier on this afternoon were feeling that we have got this difficult problem that Jane alluded to, that those patients who are most potentially at risk from the sort of infections vaccines might prevent are our frail older patients who are li liable to decompensate, liable to never recover fully in terms of their functional capacity after an illness, and yet they're the ones who we know because of their frailty, one of the features of their immunosenescence, and they're less likely to respond well to a vaccine. And we know that very often, although we haven't got good data for many of the vaccines in common use, that the, the response rates are really quite low. Um, so I just wanted to ask you to gaze into the crystal ball again and tell us if you think the Zoster data looks very encouraging, notwithstanding the fact that it's early days. Where would you think we should next be looking? Where would be most likely to reap rewards for our older population? I'm not sure what, what, the, what, the, question, what the question is. I, I, <coughs> Where you think, from the point of view of immunology mm -hmm. and vaccine development, and the point of view of the impact on the older population, where do you think we should be, or the industry should be looking at, focusing its efforts in terms of where we're most likely to see benefit for the older population? Yeah. Well, where it'll work best and where it'll have the most impact? 
Yeah, I think the, as, as I said, <clears throat> when the, the trial for the elderly was designed, uh, for Zoster, the, the people are not divided in frail and non-frail. I mean, there was just a thing. From the data, we, <clears throat> I think we deduced that I mean, even the, the ones that, that, <clears throat> that basically had, usually do not respond to vaccination, other things have been responding. So I think we should look at that. I mean, usually you get, you need one success. And once you have something which is successful, you start to start to ask why. So far, we did not have that kind of success. So I think now we can look into that and try to understand what's happening. I, and and I, I don't know, I mean, I'm curious as well. But I think it's good to have one positive and, and, and a negative because you can start to compare them. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, I, I have still appetite about pure age, so I come back. <laughs> um, you you showed us a, a very beautiful slide, and say that there is young, which are already old and old who are still young, but you didn't say it, or I didn't catch uh, what is inside pure age, which are the parameters. That's Mm, CMV profile, it's what is inside what you talk about, bio age, uh, inflammatory mediators uh, I mean, or something? Well, f first of all, don't take that too seriously. I think it's very, I, I use because <laughs> because it's attractive, it's one paper, it's not, it's, it's, and it's not my paper, but I, I thought it was an interesting thing. And here, what you have is the age, the uh, so you have 40 years, 60 years, 80 years, and here you have what they call the bio age. And so here, whether the but it, what they do, they take the PBMC that they, they do transcript, transcriptome. Transcriptome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and basically, and then they look at the modules and the things which are so. And, and clearly here they get more inflammatory responses, which makes sense. And here they get more B cell, T cell receptor, antiviral response. So the the the, the second the next question is um, about that. Do you go further and try to have a profile and try the profile before vaccine? Well, that, that's what that's what this paper claims. It says uh, <coughs> it says that I can do your profile, giving you PBNCs. If you are on this. Thing, you're going to respond to hepatitis B. If you are in this way, you will not respond. That's, that's what the paper claims. Um, I mean, the, there is a reference. I'll give you the paper if you like. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting paper. And as now, it's pretty recent, has not been reproduced, so it's a lot. But I, I decided to use it because I think it's, it's intriguing from the point of view. I mean, I'm sure there will be something right, something wrong. Of course, wrong, it's personalized medicine, yeah. 